Genesis and chapter number 3, very first book in the Bible. And uh, many of you know, as soon as you say Genesis 3, you've already got an idea in your head where we're going with this. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm not tricking you today. If you know Genesis 3, then you know I'm going right there. That's where I'm going. Genesis chapter number 3, we're going to look at verse number 1 once you found your place. I'm thankful for the Word of God. I'm thankful for every, every word that is fitly in its place. I'm thankful, for, uh, I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit of God and how He works in your life. This week I was, I was listening to uh, some messages and just, just listening. to. I, just, I, I try to get myself just in the environment of preaching. Uh, not that I'm trying to get ideas. I just know that God gives me ideas while I'm under the preaching of God's word. And uh, I just just like to get myself in that environment. And I was listening to, uh, I was listening to um, somebody had talked about, uh, somebody I was listening to this week talked about, just, just briefly had talked about the temptation of Jesus in the, in the wilderness. And uh, in, in, in Matthew chapter number four, and it got me thinking about this temptation. It got me thinking about the devil and and got me thinking about, about Satan, and the Lord just started putting some thoughts together. And I'll be honest, there was a, there was a little battle this weekend in my mind going, no, nah, 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 that's not, and then, nah, yeah, no, nah, I just went back and forth and back and forth. And finally, I just said, God, I, I'm going to sit down here before this computer, and, and I'm going to start typing. And I just hope that you give me the words to try to put all these thoughts that seem very jumbled in my brain right now, uh, that we put them into something that would make some, kind of, make some sort of sense uh, for your people. So if it comes across jumbled, it's because I did not get it exactly uh, in, in order the way it should be, but I think it's clear enough that you'd get a general idea of where we're going today, and I think it'll be a help to you if you'd let it. I, at the very least, the Word of God will be preached, uh, and so that, uh, that of course, is all we need, amen, and, and His Word won't go out and come back void. It will be a blessing to us if we let it today. Genesis chapter number 3, starting in verse number 1. Once you found your place, if you're physically able, would you please stand? Let's honor the Word of God together uh, today as we look at a few verses. Very familiar, I know, uh, but still a powerful warning and uh, some great, uh, great help, um, some great information for us that has been revealed way back in Genesis chapter 3 that I believe can be helpful to us now in 2022. Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the days ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. Doesn't that sound like YouTube today? Amen. Your eyes shall be open. Itchy ears, right? Your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a, and, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat, and the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Of course, the story goes on. Uh, this is the story of the fall of man. Um, but the verses that we needed to hear today, we've already read. Let me go ahead and, and uh, pray, and we'll get on into this lesson today. Our Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for your goodness to us, and I'm thankful for your word. I pray uh, Holy Spirit of God, please be working in my heart. Please be working in the hearts of the hearers today, whether here in, in person, whether over the, so the sound of the preaching through the live stream. I pray that all of us would benefit uh, from a message from your word today. God, help us to be reminded uh, of the dangers of the devil. Help us, Father, to rely upon the resources that you have so graciously provided for us today. And we'll be very careful to give you all the praise ahead of time. I know this message is for Christians. But Father, if there's somebody here or under the sound of the preaching and have not yet trusted Jesus as their personal Savior, I beg you, dear God, help them to be extremely uncomfortable. I pray that you bring about a very intense and very clear conviction on their heart. Help them to see that they are a sinner, lost, uh, and on their way to hell and in desperate need of a Savior, Jesus Christ. Then the Holy Spirit convince them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Father, I pray that one would make that, that uh, free will decision. Uh, to accept Christ as Savior so that we could also testify that the Spirit regenerated them as well. We thank you so, so much, God, for what you're going to do. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I do not revere the devil. I do not give him reverence. I do not lift him up. Uh, he does not share the incommunicable attributes of the God of heaven. 
The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians in chapter number 4 that he is the God of this world, uh, but that is only a lowercase g, not a capital G. He is not a deity. He is not self-existent. Uh, can I remind you today, church, that it is not Jehovah God versus the devil. The devil is a created being allowed to continue to function by God as a tool according to his perfect will and functioning in his perfect program. He was once a beautiful angel who had a lot to do with music, uh, the music of heaven, according to, we see that in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse number 13. But in Isaiah chapter number 14, we're told that in pride, he wanted to be as God. He was not content with the beautiful place, the wonderful place that God had given him. And uh, in pride, wanted to be as God. And so God removed him from heaven and made his destination and habitation that place called hell. He took a third part of the star, took a third of the stars of heaven with him, and those angels of, of heaven. Uh, many times, of course, we've, we've said this a lot of times in our life, and I think it's certainly true that uh, God's children, uh, that uh, for many of God's children, the devil don't have to put very much effort uh, into uh, hurting them because the, this world and their flesh has caused enough damage, and he don't have to really get much in the way. Uh, but listen, I want you to understand today, we do not have to be scared of the devil. Amen? We don't have to be scared of him. First John chapter 4, verse 4 tells us, uh, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? We serve, we serve uh, the Almighty God. Amen? We serve the God who is sovereign. We serve the God who is self-existent. We serve the God who created the devil. We are more than conquerors, according to Romans chapter number 8. God has not given us the spirit of fear. We find that in the book of Timothy. We, 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 we do need to understand, though, that we do have an enemy. It's, not, it's one thing for us to be very cautious to make sure that we never revere him. We're not going to give him, we're not going to exalt him, we're not going to lift him, we're going to understand his place, but at the same time, we do need to know that he is an enemy that exists. He is still in the business of deceiving he is still in the business of destroying God's people and destroying or trying to destroy and disrupt God's program. He don't like churches that are on fire for God today. He may not be able to be in all places at once, but he certainly remains active as he ever has. If anything, we could argue probably more active, for he knows his time is running out. I was thinking about this week, I was thinking about how he still desires to sift the saints of God like weed, and I know this, this don't do a great job of selling Christianity, but the truth is, when you trust Jesus to be your personal Savior, you are immediately enlisted into God's army and engaged into a spiritual warfare. That's not meant to be spooky. That's not meant to scare you. I'm just simply telling you and preaching to you the truth today. We don't see much of the actual fighting, but we certainly deal with the consequences of battles lost, and we do so way too often. You see, since Jesus won that victory uh, from death, hell, and the grave there on the cross of Calvary, raising triumphantly on that third day, the devil's opposition to God has changed. He no longer is trying to interfere with the Savior's birth and the bloodline, uh, per se, of Jesus being born to be that Savior that was promised back in Genesis chapter number 3. He knows that battle is lost. But now his efforts have turned to focus on keeping as many as he can blind to the light of the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, when it talks about the God of this world, the Bible says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And so in order for him to keep the lost blind to their need of salvation, to the, to the glorious salvation that has been wonderfully offered and provided by Jesus, Jesus uh, our, our Savior, amen, he must prevent then the messengers from being effective in getting the word of God before the lost. Do you remember that's, that's our great commission? God is not sending angels to do this bidding. He could have. But his desire, his program, the way he has ordered his program uh, for the salvation of souls or for the delivery of the message of the gospel to the lost is that the local church would be the vehicle to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying people. Of course, the local church is made up of individual saved believers, amen, saved, saved folks, uh, believers that have, uh, that have uh, uh, identified with Christ in baptism 
and regularly assemble uh, out of this world to worship the Lord. And so he's chosen to use the believers, his people, God's people, uh, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, like I said earlier, this is where God's people easily avoid the attacks of Satan, sadly. There's a good portion of God's people that are content with being saved. They're content that their sins are washed away. They're content that someday they'll be in heaven. They love all the promises of the word of God that pertain to them, but they will rarely to never confront the loss with their need of Jesus Christ as Savior. Those aren't on the devil's radar. They're not doing much for God. They're uh, just uh, casually, casual Christians. But for those that realize what they have in Jesus Christ, For those that have contemplated, considered, uh, and and really been consumed with what they were saved from, the heaven that they get to enjoy someday, the plight of those that are still lost and on their way to hell, for those that have developed a burden for those for, for the lost, for those that have yet to trust Jesus as Savior, he does everything he can to derail your efforts in order to keep you from getting the gospel or giving that gospel uh, to the lost and dying. He does everything he can to keep you from getting that gospel track or sharing your personal testimony of knowing Jesus as Savior to that one who is still without Christ. So although his focus and although his oppositional goals may have changed through the different dispensation of God's program, his tactics, though, have not changed. And that's our advantage today. He is still operating with the same tactics that he used way back in the Garden of Eden. He is still operating with those, with a, with those same uh, 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 devices. He tried to use them with Jesus in the wilderness temptation. And listen, I, t- I can tell you today, he is still using these same exact tactics in our day. Oh, praise the Lord. The Word of God, the Bible, illuminates those tactics so that we can know how to look out for those pitfalls and those snares of the devil. This message today is in no way an exhaustive study on all the subtleties of Satan. However, I certainly believe that as we consider how he operates, even if it's, if it's only general, I believe it can be a great help for us today. So by God's grace, I'd like to consider and just deliver a few thoughts uh, with you today as I preach on this thought. Satan's subtleties in our survival. Satan's subtleties in our survival. If you get nothing else, if you get nothing else out of this, if I lose you uh, somewhere in the middle of, of point number one, if you get anything else out of this, I want you to understand, you do not, Christian, child of God, you do not have to fall victim to his devices. If that's the only thing you get, it'll be, you'll, you'll be some success in the service today. The first thing I want you to know is I want you to see today, as we do see very clearly in Scripture, Satan's strategy. We are more than conquerors. Amen. In Christ, we are, we are victorious. Amen? In Christ, we are already on the winning side. I love that wonderful truth today. Amen? Aren't you, listen, all the sports and all the activities that we have, I'm, 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 I'm somewhat competitive. I like to be, a, you know, I, I try to be a, a, a good loser. Uh, but you listen, to, I just try not to lose. Amen? So I don't have to test that out. Uh, I, love, I love winning. I love being on the winning side. Isn't it a blessing? Could you imagine in all of our activities, all of the things we're thinking about winning and losing, you, you get to be able to know, to be able to be told ahead of time, you're, if, if you're on this team, you're already winning. That's what it is in a Christian life. Way bigger, way more important than any stupid football game or, or any sort of other sporting event that could take place in this world. Hey, listen, this, this life uh, in Christ is the winning life. We're on the winning side. More than conquerors. But can I tell you, our enemy is relentless. Notice a few tactics uh, that he uses in his strategy to keep the lost blinded to the gospel uh, of the Savior. I believe one of the tactics is he attacks the word. He attacks the word. Listen, God's word, his word, the Bible, what we hold in our hand today, is the final authority for all faith and practice. Can I tell you, dear brother and dear sister in Christ, the safest place for you and I is to be very clearly, plainly, and and, and just, just wonderfully within the protecting boundaries of God's precious word. I love freedom. I love liberty. But the greatest freedom, the greatest liberty that you and I enjoy in this Christian life is when we just stay safely secure in the Bible. Amen? God's word is our final authority for all faith 
and practice. I'm going to share a couple. I know this is more, I guess, more study. I'm going to slow down for just a second. I'm going to share a few verses uh, that were a blessing to me in, in thinking about God's word. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7, the Bible says, The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. I love 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I love Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick. It's alive. Amen. It's a living word and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the, of the heart. One of my favorite Bible verses on the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. That's been proven year after year after year. God's Word is, is here Amen. Years and years of, of, of trying and attempting to destroy the word of God, getting the word of God out of the hand of the people. And, and still yet today, uh, it, is, it is the most circulated book in all the world. Amen. And this, the Bible says, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. There are many more scriptures I know. These are just a few of my favorites that, I, that stood out as a blessing to me. And when, listen, when God says it, that ought to settle it. If, if uh, anytime I ever sign anything, a lot of times I sign letters and things like that, I put my name, and then I put Psalm, 100, or Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. The Bible says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You guys okay if I just testify in the word of God today? Is that, is that, I don't think that offends anybody, right? The Bible says, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them uh, there is great reward. Let's talk about the word of God. Hey, listen, in order, for a, in order for him to get any sort of foothold in our life, he must first get you to doubt question the word of God. Let's see, he, he casts doubt upon its authority and accuracy. We find that in our, in our text today. In Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1, right there in the beginning, of, uh, right there in creation, right there, everything's going so well. God had created a perfect environment. He, he, had, he had created mankind perfectly. Uh, he, he had placed them in that perfect environment. Oh, was, uh, everything was going well. Amen. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Yea, hath God said. Did you catch that? Of course he knew he had her when her response was not what God said. Amen? If you go on in there, you find out her response was, God said we can't eat it or touch it. He said, oh, I got you. You don't know the word. God said you can't eat it. Eve had already changed the scripture around by a couple words. The devil said, oh, I got you. I cannot overemphasize, church, brother, sister in Christ, I cannot overemphasize uh, the importance in personal Bible study and memorization, uh, amen, is studying it out. I cannot overemphasize the need for Bible study, especially in this day. I believe he is still whispering in the ears of man the words, yea, hath God said. And sadly, there's a lot of success in that. Many have fallen into sin. Many have fallen away from truth and into apostasy, and it all started with a little doubt in God's word. Because who you trust to be, uh, I'm sorry, be careful who you trust to be your Bible commentator. Amen? Listen, many under the influence of Satan are cunning in taking God's word out of context and making it making it, it uh, 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 declare uh, what they want it to say when they want to say it. The Bible is the best commentator on the Bible. Amen? Just study the Word of God. Just study the real thing. Just read and study the Word of God. Just memorize the Word of God. Just take it seriously. Brother and sister in Christ, just take it literally. Uh, because I tell you today, the devil is still uh, casting doubt upon its authority and upon its accuracy. Attacks the Word of God. He also copies the things of God. 
He's also a great counterfeiter. You know, we've heard me say this so many times, but it's, it's still truth, and true, and it, it won't be the last time I repeat it. Uh, but the truth is that is how the devil deals. He deals in counterfeits. Young person, the devil never tells you, never tells you about, about the consequences of that sin as he's enticing you to engage in that which is outside of the boundaries of God's precious word. Never, he never, listen, he never tells you, he never tells you what it's going to be like in your mid-20s or your 30s uh, without, with, with, the, with the boy that left you uh, to raise those kids by yourself. He, he's never going to tell you that stuff up front. Listen, as he's putting that in your ear that you don't have to listen to what the Word of God says, that that old church down there uh, in, in Comstock, Michigan is, is, is old, too old-fashioned, it's out of date, they're not changing with the times, you don't have to listen to everything that preacher has to say, you don't have to listen to what the Bible has to say, the Bible can be changed, hey, listen, it's, 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 not a, it's not absolute, it's, 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 it's fluid, just like everything else in our day, listen, you don't have to listen to it, uh, just, just go ahead and go on, do what you want to do. And you'll be okay. Listen, he never tells you what the consequences are going to look like later on. He deals in counterfeit. This will be on full display during the tribulation, of course, his counterfeit nature, when the spirit is no longer here to suppress his influence. But, but just like the spirit of Antichrist is already here, so is his counterfeit nature. Remember, church, he knows the Bible better than we do. Amen? He, he is, has, has, has many more years than us to have it memorized and has become a great manipulator of God's word for his devious benefits. God has the only begotten son. The devil has a unique son as well. Second, Second Thessalonians 2 verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, the son of destruction. God has a holy trinity. Satan has an unholy trinity. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Praise the Lord for this verse. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone and where the beast and the false prophet are, that unholy trinity, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. God has sons and daughters, children born of the faith. In his son, in John chapter 1, verse 12, says, But as many as received him to them, gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on the name, uh, believed on his name. The devil has his own offspring as well. Matthew chapter 13, verse 38. The field is uh, the field is the world. The, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The devil has apostles. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 13, for such are false, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves unto the apostles of Christ. Now, false apostles. The devil has a mark, Revelation chapter 13, verse 16, copying the sealing mark of God. Amen. This is, listen, he's a counterfeiter. He's always copying God. He's always trying to mimic God, but he's doing so uh, not, uh, not for... Uh, uh, not for uh, uh, to to uh, uh, for for the glory of God, but for the glory of Himself, and for the uplifting of Himself, and for the destruction of God's program. This is why it is so important to develop a close relationship with the real one. Amen. I cannot I cannot stress to you enough, brother and sister in Christ. Your walk with God is so vital. Your time with the Lord each and every day is so vital. Uh, dear child of God, if you, if you wander even just a little bit, you, have, you, have, you wander from the flock, you wander from the word just a little bit, you become like that, like, like that, uh, uh, like that calf uh, or, or like that injured one or like that sickly one uh, as that lion is looking and searching and seeking uh, for that one who's weak and for that one he can devour. Can I tell you, dear brother, dear sister in Christ, when you get away from the things of God, you make yourself an easy prey. Listen, it's so important. We know God personally. That way you know if you're in the midst of a counterfeit. Listen, the devil doesn't show him show up with that red jumpsuit with the horns and pitchfork. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says, and no, and, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Listen, he always comes looking beautiful. He, 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 listen, he's in the Baptist churches today. Amen. He, his, his influence, hey, like I say, he can't be in all places at all times, but his influence, he, 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 looks, he looks good. He looks right. 
He appears to be beautiful, right? He looks beautiful and, 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 and trusting. He looks godly. That's why we need to be so careful. That's why I preach. That's why I believe God is having me preach this message this morning because we must be cautious. Keep our eyes open. Know the real thing so that when the false one comes, we can see that, see right through his counterfeit nature. He attacks the word of God, but he also attracts the flesh of man. <coughs> In uh, 1 John chapter 2, Verses uh, 15 through 17, the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, now listen to this, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now notice there, in the midst of that of that imperative of not loving the world one of his devices amen verse number 16 uh, look at looking back at our text in genesis chapter number three verse six listen to this and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and did eat right she saw it was good for food that's that lust of the flesh, right? It was, that was gonna, it was gonna make her flesh feel good. It was good for food. It was gonna fill her up. It was gonna fill her belly. She could eat it, right? It would, it would, it would, it would uh, remove that hunger pain for just a moment. It was good for food. It was the lust of her flesh. She saw it. It was pleasant to look upon the lust of her eyes, right? The things that you want to have, the things that you that you enjoy looking at, the lust of the eyes. She saw that it, would, that, that it could make her be what she wanted to be, the pride of life. We know he is the God of this world, lowercase g-o-d. I just make sure we're carrying When I say that word, I'll make sure I'm, every time I want to signify. Listen, when I'm, when I'm typing out these messages, Brother John, uh, uh, this is bad English, I know it is, but I never, I, I try very hard, unless he's at the beginning of a sentence, I try very hard not to capitalize Satan, capitalize the devil. I, I know that's bad English. I know you're allowed to do that and still not, not be deifying him and all that good stuff. I just want to be careful, amen? I just want to make sure that, that he's the lowercase God of this world. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, though, tells us, the Bible says, where in times past you walked according to the course, the course of this world. I cannot, I cannot stress the importance, dear brother and dear sister in Christ, to be very careful with which fads you find yourself following. Fads are a part of the course of this world. Fads are ordered and directed, I believe, by the devil himself. Now, listen, fads are not in themselves not always wicked or bad. I'm not saying that you're wearing your hat a certain way or wearing certain kind of clothes that are in style are always wicked necessarily. Please don't misunderstand me. I just don't want to be trapped in following the course of this world. But we know that he orders the course of this world. This world does not produce Christ-honoring likeness. It promotes humanistic self-indulgence. Amen? Listen, this world is never going to help us be closer to the Lord. Amen? This world is going to help us to, help us to fulfill more of what we want. That's, that's why the dangers of being worldly, that's why the dangers of being carnal Christians are, are preached so regularly, or why the Bible mentions it so much, and why the, the Corinthian church had so much trouble being fruitful in their ministry. That's why so many churches and so many groups are, are, are not being spiritually fruitful. Oh, sure, they got numbers, but there's no lives being actually changed. The power of God's nowhere near those places because they're allowing the world into the church. I believe he desires to place the things of this world before your eyes. I'm talking about the devil today. I believe he desires to take the things of this world, those things that, 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 that appeal to your flesh and to the lust of your eyes and to the pride of life. Amen. He, he, he puts those things before your eyes everywhere you go that it would start this, salva uh, this selfish chain reaction, getting your mind off the spiritual needs of others and onto your own fleshly wants. And it is everywhere we go. 
is everything we do, in, in everything we do. Our, our Christians today, our young people today, in the, these churches are changing. Listen, it is amazing to me. I talked to some of these old, old-time preachers. Uh, we, we, quote, we quote preachers like Billy Sunday. He was a Presbyterian. Of not even not of like faith overall, but the brother, he preached Jesus. He, he preached Jesus the way, the truth, and the life. He preached against the things of the devil. He preached against the things of the world. And praise God, he preached out of this old King James Bible. You can't, you, uh, you'd, be a, you'd be shocked at the way the Presbyterians act today compared to the way they acted in, in Brother Sunday's day. Brother Leon told me about revivals that they'd have in their town and their community over there. The Baptist church could get together with the Methodist church. Uh, And and because they had some things, they had some fundamentals of the faith in common, they could preach out of the same Bible. They could sing the old same songs. They could preach that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And sure, they had some, some differences in some areas, but they were able to come together on some of the things they had wonderfully in common, amen. But they ain't like that anymore. Why is that? Why are the Baptist churches changing? Huh? Why is it? Letting the world in the church. Becoming more like the world. Because what, we, what has happened, and I, you know, all these preachers, I tell you, I, I love them, and I'm not mad at them. And they're, they're not my enemy. But they're certainly acting more and more like the enemy as the days go by. Adding the, the worldly music, the worldly dress, so listen, don't, don't worry about standards. Don't worry. Listen, that's just, listen anybody, any preacher that preaches standards, he's just legalistic. He's just wanting you, he's just, that, and they love that word, right? They love that word, but that word is so far from preaching standards. Legalistic means that, that, that the preacher's standing here saying you have to to get to heaven. He's, it's not that he's saying this is what the Bible says, we ought to obey it. There's two different, there's two different minds, uh, two different thought processes there, amen? Legalistic says that, that, this, that you have to do this in order to get to heaven. You have to have these standards, you have to live this way, and if you don't, you're going to hell. That's legalistic. That's, that's a Judaizer. You have to obey the law in order to get to heaven. I, I, you've never heard me preach that from this pulpit. It is all about what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. Amen? But grace isn't a license for sin. Grace has a high expectation for the believers, Amen, a higher expectation than those that are living by the law. We don't have time to to go there, but he tries the same exact tactic with Jesus in Matthew chapter number four. He tries to present it the same way he did to Eve. He tries to present, he tries to appeal to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, to the humanity of our Savior Jesus Christ. Of course, he does so to no avail. Amen, he lost in that interaction. But praise God, we won because we can study and we can apply the Savior's victorious response to that old devil. And and the blessing is that Jesus' response can be summed up with three precious words. It is written. It is written. So, amen, we're aware of Satan's strategy. And let me consider here, as quick as I can, the saint's solution. James chapter 4, and verse number 7. I told you these were scattered thoughts. I mean, we didn't just stay in one passage of the scripture. I apologize for that. You know I like to. But the Lord had me all over the place, and it was probably more scattered than this. Praise God that he gave me some, it was able to bring the, rain these things in just a little bit and give us some sort of a, a semblance of an outline here. But we see, the, we see the, the, the Satan's strategy, but we see the saint's solution. James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Obviously, from our Savior's response, <clears throat> the simple answer is Scripture. The simple answer to the wiles of the devil, to the pitfalls of Satan, to the snares that, of that old wicked one is the Word of God, the very thing he attacks initially in his strategy to deceive you. Isn't that amazing? What? Would, would things have been different? We know they wouldn't have, or they could have, or we just don't know because there's something, you know, God, God's, I, we, we, we shouldn't dwell on the what ifs. But what if Eve would have known the scripture just a little better? What if? What if her answer in response to that old wicked one would have been more of a clear 
scriptural response and not something that was, not that she was already confused in. I, I don't know. Like I said, we're not going to dwell on those what is. But if you know what the word of God says, I can, I can tell you today, brother and sister in Christ, you are greatly benefited in this spiritual warfare. Not for the sake of knowledge that puffeth up. And I could see the word of God, the knowledge of the word of God. I've seen that also be, be turned into the wrong thing. I've seen it turned into a weapon. That's not what I'm talking about today. The, the, the weapon of the word of God is not against your brothers and sisters in Christ. It is against that old wicked one. It's not to be used. It's not to be that knowledge that puffeth up. Uh, so that, so that uh, uh, it is so that you would know how to answer temptation. In the book of James, we see the saint's solution to Satan's strategy. First thing we see is resign. The first part of the saint's solution uh, is to resign. That first part of verse number 7 there, James 4, that first part of verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. That's where it all starts. You're going to have victory? It's going to start right here. Amen. This goes against everything our human nature is screaming. Amen. It goes against everything this flesh wants to be. Amen. But this is what we are to do. We are to resign. We are to, we are to submit to the Lord. Amen. We are created to bring honor and glory to the Lord. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 tells us this. You might say, well, why is there, why, why is there a conflict then? Well, why didn't God, why didn't God, if he created us to glorify him, why didn't he just create us with a sanctified will, with a pre-program to just worship him for all eternity. I believe that it is because from the beginning he desired that we would choose to surrender to his will and choose to worship him. I believe that is exactly why he gave Adam that free choice. I believe he desired Adam to stay within those boundaries willingly. I believe he desired Adam to consider the blessings of God and to say, God, if this is how you want it, then that settles it. That's how I'm going to do it. His boundaries were very simple. The consequences for disobedience were, were made very clear. I believe we still have very clear boundaries today in the Word of God. The most effective way, brother and sister in Christ, the most effective way for us to stay inside those boundaries is to submit ourselves to the Lord. Just be yielded to the will of God. Hey, it's going to be real hard for you to step outside those boundaries if you just want what God wants. Amen? It's going to be hard, it's going to be hard for you, or harder for you to be tempted to walk outside of the boundaries of God's will. Uh, it's going to be much harder for the devil to attack the word of God if you just have a res resignation to his will. God, your will be done in my life. We have every reason. Oh, I, we, this is a blessing. We have every reason to trust that his way is always right and for our good. Where's the argument then? Hey Amen. If God says it, why doesn't that just settle it? Hey Amen. If we, if we could just have a confidence that he is almighty God and that his word is always right and that by being inside of his boundaries are always to our benefit, then where is the argument and where is the fight? Hey, if we could just resign to that right now in this service today, if you and I could just, just, uh, just crucify this old flesh and we could just, just, just uh, 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 kill this old stubborn will of ours and just say, I'm going to resign to the will of God today, you and I would enjoy a lot more victory than we do. It starts by resigning to God. But it also continues on here in resistance. We see, the, we, see, we see the need to resign. We see the need to resist. The Bible says in the middle part of that verse, number 7 of James chapter 4, resist the devil. Resist the devil. Resist him. I believe this is best pictured in Christ's response. Our only weapon of resistance is the very word of God. Can I tell you, it is written still wields the power of God in all the spiritual battles of life. It's written. It's written. 
What does the Bible say? It's written. Of course, you must know what the, what's written before you're going to be successful in resisting with the words. It's written. We resist the devil best when we know our Bible faithfully. Amen? I, I, I just want to help you. I love you. I care for you. I pray for you. I want to see you victorious. Young people, I want to see you victorious. Young people, I don't want to see you get caught up with the wickedness of this world. Uh, adults, young families, silver-haired saints, I don't want to see you uh, become a statistic in, 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 the, the, uh, in the accusers, in, the, in our enemies' uh, warfare. But you need to know what is written before you can use the words, it is written. We see the resistance. We see the need to resist. And then lastly, in that first seven there of James chapter number four, we also see the retreat. The Bible says, and he will flee from you. What a wonderful, wonderful promise in the word of God. Christian, you know what this promise tells me? You do not have to be tricked by the devil. You do not have to live defeated by the old adversary. Hey, man, you do not have to, to fall victim to his temptations. You do not have to uh, operate under his influence. You do not have to be oppressed by the devil. You do not have to be victim in this spiritual warfare. You do not have to fail in this Christian life. You do not have to live uh, in, in, in a way that, uh, that causes you to be defeated. Praise God, you can be victorious uh, in this spiritual warfare. You do not have to live under the temptation of the devil. You have everything. You have been given everything necessary to live a life that victoriously honors the Savior. Man, that blesses my heart today. I love the certainty of the words, He will flee from you. He will flee from you. If you resign to God, if you surrender to the Lord, if you resign to the will of God, if you resist with the word of God, he will retreat. Because he's going to go on. He's going to go on to those Christians making TikTok videos. Right? He's going to go on to those that are messing around on Facebook or messing around on Twitter or messing around on all those other... Man, I heard somebody list off... I, don't, I could not believe how many social platforms, social media platforms are out there today. He's going to go on to those that are thumbing through the pages of wickedness. He's going to go right to there. He's going to go to the easy prey. When you say, God, I just want to serve you. I want to live within the protecting boundaries of your precious word. Lord, I submit myself to you. God, I'm surrendered to your will and way. And that's not just lip service, but God sees that in your heart. And then you tell that old devil, listen, you might want to try to get me to do this, but you know what the Bible says? Hey, it is written. This is what the word of God says, and this is what I'm holding on to. He has nothing left to do but to retreat. Amen? God has given us all the enabling. But our victory rests upon our will to obey. Will we yield to the Lord today? Will we resist the devil today? Will we witness Praise God, will we witness retreat today? Let me close. It is sad to see all the defeated Christians out there in the world today. It is so sad to see God's people living the way they do, living by the lust of the flesh, completely blind to the need and the, the importance of sanctification. So many preachers 
preaching, this just appealing to the, you know, listen, I want to make sure I get a good paycheck, so I'm going to keep appealing to this, to this changing uh, Christian lifestyle, and, and I'm going to stop preaching hard on sin and, 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 and stop preaching separation and just say, listen, just do what you want to do. And all these that have been deceived to the importance, they've been blinded to the light of sanctification. Listen, your separation from the world is more, much bigger than God just trying to be a bully and take away the fun of this world. He wants to use you to display the light of Christ to the lost in your sphere of influence. When you're tainted, when you are, when you are filthied up with the wickedness of this world, you are going to have a real hard time showing the light of salvation to the lost because you too are blinded to the light of sanctification. The devil has sadly become very successful in a lot of Christian homes, a lot of Christian lives today. But the blessing is he does not. There is no guarantee of victory for him. He does not have to win. Christian, you do not have to fall victim to the devil's devices. He's been playing the same card since Genesis chapter number 3. We know what he's doing and we know how to be victorious. It rests upon your will to obey. It's sad to see the defeat. Oh, but praise God, you don't have to live that way. If God's revealed today that you are living in that defeat, you don't have to any longer. Amen? Resign, resist, and watch that wonderful retreat. Would you stand with me today? We know from Scripture that no believer has to submit to succumb to the subtleties of Satan. I ask you today, has the devil been successful in your life? Has he been able to keep you blind from your needs of Jesus as Savior, if you're a lost person today? Believer, has he been able to get you to resign to your humanistic tendencies rather than to the one who wonderfully saved you, empowered you, and has sent you out to reach the lost with his, with his wonderful gospel? I want to encourage you today, resist. Resist that devil and watch him flee. I'd encourage you today to resist. He'll flee. Resign and resist and watch him retreat. With eyes closed and heads bowed, I don't know how God's helped you today. I don't know how he spoke to you today. But I'm just confident this is exactly what God wanted me to preach this morning. I was comforted by the Holy Spirit of God. I certainly sensed the battle, the spiritual battle, in getting here today. I can feel my flesh fading and failing as I preach. And so it just, I just know this is what God wanted you to hear today. As Lydia begins to play, what's God spoke to you about today? Don't let him win. Don't let him have victory in your households. You don't have to. It's not God versus the devil. The devil is a created being under the command of Almighty God, the one who loved you and sent his son to die in your stead, the one who sent his Holy Spirit to be your comforter, the one who empowers you, the one who enables you to serve him, to live for him, to be within the boundaries of God's precious word, the, the boundaries that aren't there because he's trying to be a bully. The, ones that, the boundaries that are not there, not there because he's trying to take away your joy, but are there to keep your joy being full. The greatest joy in my life is found serving the Savior, safely protected by his precious words. That's the joy of the Lord. Hey, man, it's right there. The devil wants to trick you. Oh, no, your joy is found in the things of this world. 
Oh, no, 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 your joy is found in the more stuff you can have. Right? But that's not right. It's not true. Your joy is found in the Word of God. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as Savior, I can't encourage you. I can't encourage you enough to make sure you trust Jesus to be your personal Savior today. Put your faith and trust in Him. Believe on Him. Get saved today. Trust Jesus today. Don't wait another day. Don't wait another moment. I hope the Lord's helped you today. I hope you've been challenged. I hope that you've been encouraged. I hope that you've been comforted today. I hope the Lord's helped you today.